All right, well, hello everybody. Welcome to the Bureau of Economic Geology Summer Seminar Series. I'm Evan Civil, and I'll be your host today. The uh, Summer Seminar Series is designed to showcase talks and discussions beyond the research we do at the Bureau. It focuses on our hobbies, our interests, our day-to-day -day lives, and maybe uh, past research that we've done in the, the past. So today, our speaker is Dr. Mark Schuster. Mark is the Associate Director for Energy and is responsible for managing the Bureau's energy-related research. He joined the Bureau in September of 2016. Prior to joining the Bureau, he worked for Shell and Affiliates for 30 years in upstream oil and gas roles around the world. Mark began his professional career as a research geologist, working on projects on the Permian Basin, Atlantic Margin Basins, and Southeast Asia. Subsequently, he worked on exploration and appraisal projects in Venezuela, Australia, Middle East, Gulf of Mexico, and more recently, Alaska. Mark received his Bachelor's of Science degree in geology from the University of the Pacific and his PhD in geology from the University of Wyoming. Before we begin today, I ask that you silence your, uh, your microphones as respect to the speaker. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat and uh, Mark will be answering them at his first availability. So with that said, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Great, well, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Evan. And uh, also let me thank uh, Jana and Aaron for uh, their work in getting this set up and, and managing the, the process. You know, I, I really like these uh, seminar, summer seminar talks. They're, they're kind of fun. And hopefully today will be uh, fun for all of you and a little bit different. You know, my uh, intent is to uh, share some stories with you that you, some of you may be aware of, some may not, uh, but give you a little bit different perspective on uh, the, the Permian Basin or one aspect of it. Um, just to kick off, you know, when uh, I was asked to do a seminar, uh, by Gina, I, I said, sure. Uh, I wasn't really thinking about exactly what I, I wanted to talk about, but I happened to be on a uh, Zoom with Dallas Dunlap uh, several weeks ago, and uh, he was sitting in his kitchen, and behind him was this image. It was kind of an abstract image. It was beautiful, and uh, you know, I was trying to figure out what it was, and it turned out it was a photo that one of his kids had taken uh, within Carlsbad Caverns, and it was kind of slightly out of focus, but it, it made for this wonderful image. And it, when he said that, I said, well, you know, uh, Dallas, is, it's interesting because uh, my grandfather, uh, Will Schuster, uh, who was an artist, went down into the caverns back in the uh, early 1920s with a fellow artist, a guy named uh, Walter Muir to uh, paint their impressions of the caverns, so, you know, prior to the, the uh, caverns becoming a, a national park. And, and I thought, well, you know, that might be an interesting topic to share in that it's, it's kind of an interesting side story or backstory uh, with Carlsbad Caverns. And as I, as I dug into, you know, finding a little bit more information on that, and they had some personal information, some of this has been written up as well. You know, I also got into some of the uh, history of the early exploration, and I, I found, you know, that there was a whole set of these backstories that were very interesting about how the caverns uh, were discovered, uh, how they were explored, how they were promoted, and eventually how they were developed. And in addition to that, you know, there, there is some uh, geological insight and observations from uh, very comprehensive studies of uh, Carlsbad Caverns and uh, surrounding caves in the, the Guadalupe Mountains that also provide a, a different perspective and shed some in light, uh, insight on the evolution of the Delaware Basin that's, uh, I think, relevant for a lot of the stuff that we're doing in the, in the Delaware. So anyway, that, that was kind of the initiation of uh, this is a, a topic for discussion. So today I want to uh, share some of these stories, some of the history, uh, not only of the Carlsbad Caverns, but uh, some of the other uh, caves in the Guadalupes, and uh, also talk a little bit about the, the people that are involved in the, the early exploration and uh, the uh, focus on these backstories, and also their, their motivation, which seems to be, uh, if I generalize, kind of a combination of curiosity and opportunity, uh, which is interesting. And uh, so 
what I'm going to do is first set uh, kind of the historical and uh, geographic context, uh, then present these stories. And uh, finally, because I am a geologist, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the geology. So we'll finish up with uh, uh, some of the geology, particularly as it relates to the, the evolution of uh, the Delaware Basin. So a few words on Carlsbad Caverns as a national park. So uh, it was established as a national park in 1930. And in its 90 year history, it has attracted over 45 million visitors. Uh, it, it was really one of the icons for the US National Park Service. And you know, I, I think it's, it's really cool that people have come to actually view this uh, geological phenomenon as a, a subterranean national wonder. You know, uh, you see the bumper sticks, uh, stickers still on the cars, you know, come visit uh, Carlsbad Caverns. Uh, and, you know, the story of it, how it was discovered and explored and developed has also developed uh, into its own lore, mythology around the caverns and is part of the uh, Carlsbad Caverns uh, brand. It's part of the, the Park Service brand. So it's, it's kind of interesting to be able to go into, you know, some of those uh, aspects in, in a little bit more detail and, and understand uh, the, the origins of, of the caverns as a park and what was happening with the caverns before it came a park. Um, as I mentioned previously too, you know, they're in part because of the focus on the Carlsbad caverns, there's been a lot of studies that have been conducted, a lot of uh, geological studies. And the, these studies have led to, I, I think, some very detailed uh, analytical results and insights and observations that you are almost unique to the area just because you probably wouldn't be able to find them elsewhere. And so taking those kernels of observations from this you know, uh, very detailed and comprehensive work does provide us uh, a nif another means to look at, uh, you know, how this part of the Delaware uh, Basin uh, has uh, evolved and deformed and how these caves were formed. So let's start with setting the scene uh, with uh, some of the geography first. And just to get you located, so uh, here is Carlsbad. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but you see the star there. Uh, here are the uh, Guadalupe Mountains. There, Carlsbad uh, Caverns National Park is located in, in New Mexico. And just south of the, uh, the uh, New Mexico-Texas border is the uh, Guadalupe Mountains uh, National Park. And we're looking at this part of uh, the, the Permian Basin, uh, the subset of the, uh, the Delaware Basin there. So basically the, the area of uh, southeastern New Mexico and uh, uh, west Texas. And, you know, this area, as far as humans are concerned, is just not, not easy country. And uh, it never has been. I mean, even uh, with the onset of Clovis Man uh, 13,000 years ago, we were wandering around eastern New Mexico and western Texas, you know, they're struggling to uh, try to eke out a living there. And then you had uh, more recent Native Americas, uh, Americans uh, like Jumanos that were in the Trans-Pecos area and the uh, Mescalero Apache that uh, were living in, in the uh, Guadalupes as well as uh, some of the uh, adjacent mountain ranges. And, you know, those, those were about the only uh, settlers there. And uh, when the Spanish colonized the area, um, you know, basically they treated this area as kind of the area to pass through, not to settle. And uh, with, uh, you know, Texas becoming a republic and, and that area be, uh, being pushed to the west, there wasn't a lot of interest from the Texans in, in coming in this area either. And, and that's mainly because you just have the, the, the Pecos River, the surrounding areas, uh, you know, effectively the uh, Yana Escado, it's, uh, you know, very dry plains, uh, semi-arid to arid. And the, the only agriculture is really limited uh, to the, the Pecos River Valley specific. And it wasn't until uh, oil was discovered um, in the Artesia area in the 1920s, and uh, uh, Soon after Potash, uh, uh, just east of Carlsbad, the, the area started to see some real economic development. So it's kind of been a, 
uh, area on the margins for a long time. And it's, uh, even if you talk to the uh, uh, folks that raise cattle, you know, it's not particularly a great cattle country either. There's just not a lot of grass. You got a lot of yucca, you got a lot of uh, cactus. And, um, you know, so it's an area that has been certainly agriculturally and economically kind of stifled for a long part of its history, again, until uh, oil and gas and uh, potash were uh, developed. So let me talk a little bit about uh, this chronology. It's kind of a, a crazy chronology because we're, it's non-linear, it's bouncing around from uh, uh, Permian times all the way to the present day. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight, you know, some of what we'll be talking about today. And for the most uh, of, of the discussion, it'll be on this stretch of history from about 1900 to uh, 1940 through the uh, Great Depression. But then we'll circle back, talk a little bit about uh, the geological history, particularly as it relates to the uh, caverns and some of the insights of the caverns that are, are relevant for uh, development of uh, Delaware Basin. And uh, bring us up to present day with the discussion of uh, some of the uh, geological models. And I'll also set the scene with some of the history uh, ahead of uh, 1900s, just so we can start to put uh, what's happened here in context. So we're gonna talk about exploration and opportunities. And I, I think it's really again, important to know that this was an area where people pass through, usually as quickly as they possibly could. And uh, you know they didn't see uh, much value in, in settling here. And uh, prior to the area becoming a part of the US in uh, 1948, you know, they, the Spanish and the Mexicans uh, looked at this as just not having much interest. And they, there's a great quote from a, this historian, Hal Rothman, who says that the, the Guadalupe Mountains and Trans-Pecos region remained marginal throughout the Spanish and Mexican period. Its desert-like conditions and especially the lack of water made it unattractive except as a place to pass through. And then after uh, the U.S. took over, which was a result of the, the Mexican-American War and the Treaty of Hidalgo. Uh, the, the, the settlers in the U.S. And, uh, had the same view, uh, in, in also of all of New Mexico. And it uh, goes on and says, New Mexico was a periphery in the United States. The Guadalupe Mountains and Trans-Pecos area were the peripheries of a periphery, a place that few Americans considered when they forced Mexico to sign over much of its northern lands. This was no surprise. Neither Mexico nor the Republic of Texas had any use for this remote region. This desert never figured in Mexican or Texican plans, except when Mescaleros or other peoples in the vicinity threatened order in the region's core areas. Nor did Americans see any obvious use for this region except to pass through it. And uh, subsequent to the uh, American-Mexican War, there were a few U.S. expeditions, some actually uh, coming here out of uh, Texas, from Austin specifically, others uh, uh, coming from elsewhere in the country, and they explored the Guadalupes, you know, and this actually is a, a sketch from uh, one of those early expeditions. And, you know, they commented on, on the beauty, but the, the harsh area is a reality here. And, the area really didn't uh, develop, you know, there, there, there was a little bit of some springs. There was uh, a place called Pinery Station, which was actually at the, at the base of uh, the Guadalupes. It was uh, a stage stop for a short time for the uh, uh, Butterfield uh, uh, Stagecoach Trail, but th that didn't last very long. And so it, this was an area that was kind of neglected for quite a bit of time. And after um, the Civil War and, you know, th there was a little bit more focus on settlement and, um, but still not much going on. And we st started to see that this area, uh, at least east of the Pecos River, uh, was part of uh, the, the cattle trails that were established, so specifically the Goodnight Loving Trail. But it, you know, it's a fairly bleak and uh, desperate area. And like I said, it's not particularly good for uh, raising cattle. And it wasn't until uh, the 1880s that uh, with the onset of some irrigation projects that they started to further develop the uh, agriculture in the area. 
So, you know, I, I sum it up and I, I say this um, uh, with my brother living in southeastern New Mexico right now, and he's been there for you know, 30 years. Uh, you know, it's a, kind of a, a godforsaken place. And uh, it, I think that sets the scene for, in particular, why there was so much focus on uh, some of the exploration and, and discovery that we'll talk about uh, in the Guadalupe, Carlsbad specifically. And here's an uh, uh, old oblique aerial photo. You can see this is actually covering the area of, uh, of the current uh, Carlsbad Caverns National Park, um, with some of the old roads. And, you know, it's for those that have been, I'm sure most of you have been to Carlsbad Caverns. You know, it's, uh, unless you're a geologist, there's just uh, not a lot to, to see there. You know, it's, it's pretty rugged. You don't raise cattle, uh, you can hardly make a go of it with their goats or sheep either. So let's move on and talk a, a little bit about the discovery of the, of the caverns and the, the discoverers. And, you know, the, again, as part of the lore for the National Park Service, you know, they love this stuff and everybody loves this stuff. Is to, you know, who actually discovered the caverns? How, they, how were they found? You know, how were they initially explored? And, you know, there's, there's some pretty cool stories. Um, that have been uh, published uh, and you know, the, the claim list is long, as you might expect, you know, there are over 20 documented claims of discovery of the, of the caverns, you know, stretching from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. Uh, but of those claims, uh, and this is talking about, you know, Western people, you know, the white settlers uh, in the area, because the Indians knew about these caverns for a long time. Uh, but of the two claims, uh, the two that really stand out as most incredible and undoubtedly the most impactful are a claim of, uh, by uh, Abijah Long, who's this gentleman over here, and who also had a book written about his uh, discoveries, and then uh, Jim White. And Jim uh, is probably the, the, the one that gets uh, recognized most for having uh, done the, the biggest promotion and uh, development of, of the caves in the, is early in its history. So I tend to come across this quite a bit. Um, so when we look at Jim White's claim, you know, it's all about bats and there's, uh, you know, uh, the stories and I, I remember hearing these as a kid about, you know, how he found the caverns and as a matter of fact, I'm sure the park rangers still uh, tell these stories that, you know, he was about 1900 out riding uh, on his horse and uh, he was doing a little bit of work trying to mend a fence and he saw what looked like a uh, volcano or a whirlwind. And so he rode over to it and uh, found this hole and this whirlwind wasn't behaving like it should. And it, he realized it was uh, bats and that they uh, he saw this hole and the bats were coming out and he said bats seemed to literally boil out of the ground. And uh, that's where he uh, made his initial discovery of, of the cavern. And he had, then was associated with the caverns uh, for the rest of his life in one capacity or the other. And, uh, you know, he's written a book about his uh, you know, claim to fame, but he did a lot uh, with the caverns. And he was, uh, beyond making this discovery, he was also uh, involved in some of the guano mining, which I'm gonna uh, touch on. He explored the caverns uh, mainly from a curiosity perspective. For, and, and I think he became a guano miner in part so he could get down in the caves and, and do some exploration. And then eventually he also became uh, a, one of the early park rangers uh, for uh, the caverns and uh, really did quite a bit in terms of promoting uh, the area for visitation, even ahead of the caverns. They were uh, starting to take, you know, uh, locals down in the caverns to let them, uh, you know, uh, see the uh, grandeur of, of these caverns. So, you know, he played a, a significant role in uh, the cavern's history. Move now, now and talk a little bit about guano. Yep, uh, bat poop. And uh, this is where Abijah Long comes in. And he, again, he has a claim for, of discovering the caverns. Um, yeah, but what 
is important about his claim is that he actually filed a claim. He, uh, after he came across the caverns, and uh, there's a great story where he and a couple of his friends descended in the caverns and they, they smelled this god awful smell and looked around and with lanterns were able to see that this was a, a deposit of guano that stretched for a quarter mile long and that was a uh, hundred feet thick. And so based on that, he uh, rushed back to Carlsbad and filed a claim to uh, mine the guano. And guano at the time was of uh, econ a strong economic interest. It, it dwindled a, a little bit since uh, late 1800s, but in particular because of the uh, rising agriculture in uh, California with the citrus uh, orchids, uh, orchards, uh, you know, there was a, a big uh, desire and need for uh, fertilizer. And so that was the, the market for the, the guano in this area. So anyway, he filed a claim and began to set up a mining operation, which you can see in the, in the photo here, uh, to uh, mine out uh, the guano from uh, Carlsbad Caverns. And, you know, he was a productive mind as, as far as uh, guano is concerned, at least based on what I've read. And uh, at peak operation, they had about 20 to 40 uh, men that were actually involved in, in the mining operation. They had a hauler here, which was uh, basically a bucket where they could pull up the guano and, and also let down people. And uh, then the, the mine uh, was manually dug, and I'll show a photo of that in a second. Uh, but they basically extracted about uh, 450 pound bags of uh, guano per day. And so that equates to about 10 tons of, of guano per day you know, from hand digging. So it was a big operation. Uh, it lasted roughly 20 some odd years. And, you know, they estimate, uh, you know, something on the order of 100,000 tons of, of guano that uh, eventually were extracted from the, the caverns. So here's a photo, uh, you know, with the, the guys uh, working in the, or sitting back probably after working in some of the, the equipment that they had in the Carlsbad Caverns. And, you know, this was really horrendous work, even at the time, uh, the uh, uh, people looked at uh, guano mining as being below some of the other uh, really difficult and demeaning uh, industries, you know, below coal mining. It was uh, worse than uh, butchery or meat packing. And, uh, you know, it's nasty to think about. How, how would you like to be up to your hips and uh, back crap all day? You know, it's uh, every day and it's in the dark. I, I think that would be a pretty tough uh, place to work. So, uh, just in case you don't think that there's still not a market for bat guano, well, it turns out there is uh, actually a big retail market uh, for uh, bat guano as uh, fertilizer, particularly for organic uh, uh, growing. And you can go online and you can find uh, all different kinds of uh, bat guano that's uh, being sold. You know, there's Mother Earth, there's Dr. Earth, uh, these ones down here, you, it's just like coffee. You can get Indonesian, you can get Jamaican, you can get Mexican all over the world, wherever there are caves and bat guanos, you, uh, they're sourced separately and, and retailed separately. And here's a, a great uh, listing here, which shows uh, from a report back in 1914, uh, what the uh, sodium uh, uh, phosphate and potassium uh, richness is uh, compositions for various uh, back guano deposits, which includes uh, Carlsbad and uh, other areas in the, in the Guadalupe Mountains. So in, they rate this on the, the basis of what's called the NPK, so nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium, uh, on the, the basis that uh, these different uh, uh, compounds uh, tend to help the plants grow in different ways. So you can order up high uh, uh, phosphate-rich uh, bat guano if, if you need it, or uh, high potassium, uh, however you want to do it. Kind of somewhat ironically, the uh, even though guano mining stopped in the, the 1920s, and in part because uh, the National uh, Park came to be, uh, 
the Carlsbad area kept in the, the fertilizer business because there was a, a large uh, deposit of potash uh, that was found uh, in the, the uh, Salado formation uh, just east of uh, Carlsbad. And that's an area that is basically underpinned uh, potash uh, mining from uh, Selvite specifically uh, since uh, early 1930s. And it's still being uh, mined today. And so it's, you know, it's a, the biggest uh, uh, potash or potassium resource that uh, we've got in the, the U.S. So it's, I, I find it kind of interesting that we went from guano uh, over to uh, potash and still in the fertilizer business in the area. So let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, individuals and you know how the caves were popularized and promoted and I really how they got opened up. And one of the guys that you come across quite often but really doesn't get much of the credit is a guy named uh, Ray Davis. And uh, he is shown here and he got in the caverns uh, in conjunction with uh, Jim White to, you know, try to photograph this. And again, uh, you know, Jim White was all about trying to promote this and uh, drive interest in the caverns. So Ray Davis, who's uh, from Carlsbad and had been a farmer, but decided didn't like farmer farming and wanted to go into photography, took that up and uh, proceeded to uh, initiate uh, the world and open the world to uh, some uh, photos of this uh, subterranean uh, wonder. And uh, eventually photos, and I'll talk a little bit about the National Geographic, but some of his photos you know, early on uh, made uh, quite a quake uh, in the New York Times and were circulated regionally and, and nationally and uh, it drove a lot of the interest, uh, early interest uh, in the caverns. Another of the uh, folks that don't get a lot of uh, recognition, but really uh, a key part of the early history of the, of the caverns is a guy named uh, uh, Willis Lee, and he was a USGS geologist. Uh, he'd been based in Albuquerque and, and done uh, geological studies across the, the western U.S. as part of the USGS for a number of years. He had a, a PhD from uh, Johns Hopkins. He was well established. He was a member of the Explorers Club, Cosmos Club. And he happened to also be involved in doing a lot of uh, work on uh, dams that were being constructed uh, along the, at the Pecos at the time. And uh, happened to uh, be exposed to some of these photos and uh, the lore around uh, these caverns and uh, started to take some interest in that and uh, made a, a trip first that was self-funded uh, in 1923, in part uh, associated with the, the U.S. Uh, General Lands Office to evaluate the caverns as a, a potential monument or uh, national park, and uh, eventually uh, uh, wrote an article in the National Geographic, and I'll, I'll show you the cover in just a second, and then was subsequently funded uh, at the tune of $16,000, which back in 1924 was uh, equivalent to about $160,000 uh, currently to uh, do some further work in uh, the caverns. So this is uh, the cover of the uh, article that came out by him, uh, Visit Carlsbad Cavern in New Mexico. Uh, and, you, you know, it's great when you look at these old National uh, Geographics because this was a time of romance. People were interested in these kind of things, uh, particularly focused, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, something different, exotic. And you can see there's an article on Dafur, an article on Timbuktu, and the same issue. So the Carlsbad Caverns were a big thing. This was, you know, getting people's interest and attention. And, uh, in part because of his influence and connections, uh, Lee was a, uh, a really driving force in the caverns eventually becoming a, a national monument. And so he published a couple of uh, articles in the National Graphic, uh, conducted this research, and uh, you know really uh, brought the national caverns to prominent national interest. So the story that I had mentioned early on that kind of relates to, to me as a family is that back in 1924, 
right after the, uh, the first article in National Geographic came out, my, my grandfather, Will Schuster, who's uh, this guy on the right, and uh, his uh, fellow painter, uh, Walter Muir, decided that they would uh, leave Santa Fe, New Mexico and go down to Carlsbad and paint their impressions of the caverns. And uh, they, they looked at this as an opportunity for a first. And, uh, you know, to get something new and different. You know, they, they were looking for this opportunity. And uh, they had been part, there are two of five members of a painting group called Los Cinco Pintores, which was established in uh, Santa Fe in the early 1920s. And basically this was a group where these guys got together mainly for survival purposes. Because, you know, they're all struggling artists. And, uh, four or five that uh, recently come from the East Coast, uh, including my grandfather, to settle in Santa Fe and, and to paint. And uh, they were, you know, trying to uh, build their portfolio and get shown. And, you know, they had to essentially band together for survival and uh, out of economic necessity. And so they, they put together this uh, group and uh, as I said, two of them decided that it was, uh, would be a great thing to really, uh, you know, have a novelty of painting this uh, exotic uh, cavern. So uh, Will Schuster and Walter Muirk uh, made this trip uh, down to Carlsbad with the help of uh, Ray Davis, who's the photographer that I mentioned previously. And they spent a few weeks down there, and they, uh, uh, you know, were essentially staying up top at the uh, in the Guano, uh, Guano mining camp, and then uh, would uh, crawl down the, the ladder, um, or sometimes use the bucket. But the bucket was actually being used uh, uh, for the the expedition uh, for the National Geographic Society at the time, as well as the mining. So most of it was uh, by ladder. And then they would uh, uh, go down every day, uh, spend a full day there uh, with their lanterns on and a little pack of food and drawing materials. And then they would sketch uh, the caverns and then come out at night. And, um, and you know, as he, my grandfather wrote, he swore that every night they would both agree that they would never go down there again because it was like uh, mountain climbing underground as he described it. And then, uh, pretty harsh. But from that, they were able to, you know, generate some, uh, I think, pretty interesting works of art. And, you know, so they, they uh, had a couple of showings, uh, and I'm going to go through a few of the paintings. Uh, this is one by uh, Walter Murek. And uh, the, the uh, cr critics thought, you know, that this, these were extraordinary pictures, and this is, you know, the, the initial uh, regional assessments. And, uh, you know, so they thought they, they had a good thing here, you know, that this would give them uh, fame and, and notoriety and establish themselves in the artwork. But by the time these paintings, and here's one, uh, my grandfather, uh, he did a, a whole series uh, in different shades and tones. And this one is uh, gold. Uh, here's another one that's uh, it's a more structured type of lighting. Um, and, and actually, I just, uh, Robin was, uh, Domis was sharing a photo of this, the, the Rock of Ages, I think, uh, in, in the caverns. And as I was saying, the, by the time the uh, Eastern critics got it, uh, and they didn't really take much notice. And so it ended up that there, there wasn't all that much interest in this. And uh, uh, Will Schuster had a, a mentor uh, in New York, a guy named John Sloan, who was also an artist. And uh, there was a letter that he wrote them, you know, just really lamenting the, the fact that, th that these paintings didn't really go anywhere. And uh, the advice back from John Sloan was, well, hey, move on and come up and start to paint above ground and leave the, uh, the subterranean for others and focus on human life, which actually my grandfather did for about 10 years. But then uh, the depression hit. 
And uh, as part of the New Deal stimulus, so this might resonate with some of today's times, there uh, was a scheme that uh, the um, uh, Roosevelt administration uh, put together called the, the Federal Art Project. And the, the whole intent of the Federal Art Project uh, was to really uh, provide a means for artists to survive and make a living during the Depression. So they, they uh, uh, had a call for proposals and uh, you know, Will Schuster decided to put in a proposal to go back into the caverns and paint a number of panels for the, the National Park Service at the time. And it was uh, approved. And uh, he was really uh, in poor financial straits at the, the time. And uh, he wrote that this is the most important thing that has happened to the Schuster family, 42 50, uh, a week from the government for painting. My God, it doesn't seem real. So this was a big deal and uh, it, it kept him afloat for another year. And I th think the, the other point with this is that this, this whole program, and uh, this was the, the first and then it continued with the uh, Works Progress Administration, uh, I think it employed over 10,000 artists in total over uh, about an eight year uh, time period. And it included the artists that you will have heard uh, about like Diego Rivera, Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, um, John Sloan, so uh, Will Schuster's mentor. And uh, some of these artists weren't known at the time. So it was a way to, to really keep the art the artists surviving. And the other thing that it did is it put art to the common person. It provided a means to allow for these paintings and murals and sculptures to be accessible in post office or federal buildings or in uh, National Park uh, Visiting Center. So, you know, I, I think it was, it was a great thing that that happened. And it certainly was a good thing for my grandfather and that he could survive for another year as an artist. So here's an example. This is actually one of the paintings that the uh, uh, Carlsbad Caverns owns. Occasionally, uh, I think they have the paintings archived in uh, Tucson, Arizona, at uh, the National Park uh, Archive uh, uh, facility, but occasionally they'll rotate uh, the paintings on. And uh, yeah, if you're lucky, you may be able to see some of these paintings on display at the caverns if you go back there. And uh, just to point out, they weren't the only guys that decided to uh, paint the caverns. The, uh, there's uh, artist Raymond Johnson, who's uh, you know, relatively famous, particularly as an abstract uh, artist, that uh, also made a visit uh, in the late 20s and put together this trilogy of, of paintings, which uh, I think are, are pretty neat. And then uh, a number of artists have been back through the years and still are going down, uh, you know, including some uh, famous people, not uh, artists per se, well, he is, but uh, uh, Ansel Adams as a photographer went down there in uh, 1936 and, and did a whole series of, of photos uh, on the, the, uh, the caverns. And uh, Hollywood also got in the act, so there are a number of uh, movies that were shot in part in Call Bad Caverns, which includes uh, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, the, the 1959 version. So, you know, it became a place for kind of exotic representations and impressions. So now, as I promised, and it looks like we're still doing okay with time, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, geology. And, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go into great detail on uh, the geology, and, but I think it's uh, good to understand a little bit how these caves form. And also, most importantly, for me at least, is what we can understand from the cave formation that gives us some insights on the, the plumbing and uh, the evolution of uh, the Delaware Basin specifically. So here's uh, the Permian Basin uh, area. There's uh, Delaware Basin. Here is uh, location of Carlsbad uh, Caverns. Looks like that star got dropped a little bit to the south. Uh, the Guadalupe Mountains would be here, the Capitan Reef, so kind of the, the terminal uh, reef uh, development is uh, wrapping around uh, the Permian Basin. You can see the Diablo platform. 
And uh, just to get ourselves located with reference to uh, Permian Basin uh, paleogeography and, and features. Uh, if you look at the stratigraphy and, and also location of cavern development, so first let's talk about uh, the stratigraphy. So this is uh, cross-section BB prime. This is coming from uh, Kirkland's uh, 2014 work. And this is restored pre-neogene uplift stratigraphy. So you can see the uh, Capitan uh, formation. Uh, with the, the shelfal equivalents, Tansel Yates and Seven Rivers, and then off in the basin before it's been eroded and dissolved, uh, we had the uh, Castile Formation that was basically onlapping uh, the, the Capitan. And beneath that is uh, the Silica Classic uh, Bell Canyon Formation. Then it, here are the, the major caverns that uh, uh, have been studied uh, in the Guadalupe. So there's Guadalupe Peak, and sitting off here, uh, just across the border in Texas. And then you have a series of uh, well-developed caverns, including Carlsberg, uh, Carlsbad, and the uh, very significant uh, Lechuguilla uh, cave, which is uh, just a little bit further west from uh, Carlsbad caverns. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the structure. And uh, first thing to note is, and I'm sure those that have worked in Permian Basin know that everybody's falling on the, uh, the heels of uh, the work that P.B. King, uh, Philip e. King did from back in the, the late 40s. Because essentially this is his map and it's been recast in various ways. This is from a paper from Duchenne and, and Cunningham in 2006. But, you know, uh, P.B. King did basically the, the foundational work that most everybody is building on uh, subsequently. And uh, the, the key uh, structural features here are, so you have this border fault zone that's extending basically as an offshoot of the Rio Grande Rift that defines uh, the, the margin of the, of the Guadalupe Mountains and uh, the Brokaw Mountains here. And you have basically the, the trend with uh, these as exceptional uh, normal faults that everything to the, the uh, west is down, everything towards the east northeast is up. So that's, that gives you the, the structural fabric here. And uh, based on this uh, Duchenne and, and Cunningham work, here's a, a restoration, so a more broad uh, area, cross section across the Permian Basin, and uh, that shows what the current configuration looks like, so stretching to the central basin platform and all the way west of the Franklin Mountains, and then what it would have looked like prior to uh, the Regren uh, rift uh, deformation in this area. So basically you would have had the, the continuity of uh, these Permian rocks extending up uh, much further to the, to the west. And th that's important because as we'll get into, one of the uh, key things is how did these, uh, to the origin of the caves, is how did they develop and how did that interact uh, with the, the uh, structural history of the area. Um, a couple of words about cave development, and we're not going to get into the details here, but basically there are two processes. There's an epigenic and a, and a hypogenic process that allows for a case to originate. And they're not necessarily uh, exclusive. You can have uh, a little bit of both. But epigenic refers to uh, your typical karst type of development, where you've got basically descending surface waters that are, are dissolving uh, soluble rock, uh, in the case of carbonates, uh, uh, through carbonic acid, uh, with, you know, relatively uh, uh, well known and described process, you know, well developed here in Central Texas, you know, the karst landscapes are a result of that. So that's epigenic, coming from the top down. The, the other process is uh, what's called hypogenic, and this is where you actually have rising fluids um, from forest or, or free convection uh, that are, are coming uh, from below the water table that are circulating up, and these uh, uh, fluids are interacting with the uh, formations and dissolving them as a consequence of this, uh, this upward 
uh, movement of these uh, uh, fluids. And kind of with that concept in mind, and I'm not going to go through all this, is, uh, the purpose of this slide is really just to share with you that the, there was a lot of work done on the caverns. So the, the initial work actually was done back in the 40s. Where the, the models that have stuck are models that are based on a hypogenic, so uh, from the bottom rising upward model uh, based on uh, sulfuric acid as being the, the uh, uh, fluid that has done most of the dissolution in uh, the Guadalupe caverns, so Carlsbad and the others. And so there's a whole string of uh, studies that have been done, uh, you know, and there are some really great papers in this. If you're interested, I'll, I'll pass on all these uh, references to you. But they include, you know, the landmark works like from Carol Hill on the role of hydrocarbons as a source for H2S for sulfuric acid development and the origin of the Carlsbad Caverns. And uh, a really neat paper uh, by Polyak and others uh, on a dating of uh, one particular mineral here. The, the, this whole collection, though, is, I think, important, particularly if you're working in the Permian Basin but haven't been thinking about the caves, it, it might uh, behoove you to uh, take another look at some of the literature on the, the origin of these caverns because they provide some insight that has really increased our understanding of the Permian Basin. And here's a, just a, a couple of models. Uh, um, we'll go uh, through these in detail, but basically here's the, the Hill model, uh, which has been modified a little bit by uh, Duchenne, and which shows how these uh, this H2S, hydrogen sulfide, uh, is moving up dip in the system, and where it mixes with the oxygenated uh, meter arc uh, water in this model, it results in uh, production of sulfuric acid and uh, dissolution and, uh, of rocks and formation of, of these caverns. So that also is requiring some oil and gas to come into the system to produce the uh, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, uh, another model is uh, the Kirkland's model. And here's a little bit different, basically uses roots uh, for these uh, dissolving fluids to come through uh, the uh, onlapping evaporites in the Castile Formation and make their way into fractures uh, adjacent to, into the, uh, the Capitan and uh, other, uh, the rocks and uh, the, the Guadalupe's. So slightly different, basically more or less the same thing. The one thing that is different though is that uh, in this model, the uh, sulfuric acid is actually produced from a reaction with atmospheric oxygen at the water table. So not oxygenated waters, but you, you uh, effectively interacting uh, the H2S rich uh, brine with, uh, with air. So I want to come back to uh, this particular article because I, I think this is really cool, and uh, I, I'm sure many of you are associated uh, with, you know, some of the work uh, that's gone on because it's about 20 years old uh, in, in the history of uh, dating the, the Guadalupe Mountains, the uplift, and the, and the cave formation. But the uh, this group uh, found a particular mineral, in this case is uh, alunite, uh, which was a, a potassium-bearing uh, aluminum sulfate. And they were able to conduct argon-argon uh, argon dating to actually date the formation of this, uh, this mineral. Well, this mineral can only form in very low pH conditions in, in the product of sulfuric acid uh, interacting with the clay minerals. So based on that, they were actually able to date when these caves were being formed. And then, then they looked at the elevation of these caves and that they could get a history of uplift uh, through time. And uh, what it, it told them that uh, the highest caves were the oldest caves, and that uh, the uh, caves that were a lower elevation, including uh, Carlsbad and Lechiquilla, uh, had the, the youngest states. So they effectively got this uh, view of when uh, the Guadalupe's were moving up and also when the caves were forming. 
And this was moving up relative to the water table. Again, you needed uh, the water table uh, to be there with the sulfuric uh, acid in order to be able to dissolve uh, the carbonates. So the, the, all the motion was late uh, Miocene to early Pliocene. And then more recently, and this is um, about where I'll stop here with the geology, um, is some work that is really cool that uh, a group uh, led by Decker and others uh, has done looking at cave spars in uh, the Guadalupe. And um, you know, these are uh, calcite uh, spars, but they were basically predate uh, the, the formation of the caves. But these are uh, very large crystals. They've been able to date these uh, using, using uranium uh, lead techniques. And based on also some fluid inclusion work, uh, looking at uh, the, the uh, pressure and temperature uh, constraints, they can actually constrain the history of what's been going on, you know, since uh, essentially the, the, the Mesozoic. And the, uh, their conclusion is that really it's not until you have uh, um, the ignimbrite flare up in the area, which is Oligocene times, uh, early Miocene times, did you get these uh, spars to develop? And that most of the uplift has occurred subsequent to that. So as, again, associated with the uh, Rio Grande rifting. So that really constrains some of the, the uplift in, in barely histories, which has been one of the, the big questions that uh, uh, those that are working in the Delaware Basin have struggled with. So I'm gonna stop there with the geology and I just want to kind of close out this discussion and leave this open for any questions you might have. So, yeah, I think this area is um, really rich stories. You know, the Carlsbad Caverns and the other caverns in the Guadalupe, you know, they, they, they pique people's curiosity, their interests. People want to explore. They want to learn more. And, and I think that's an absolutely wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, I think, over its history, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, you know, there have been over 45 million visitors that uh, have visited the caverns. And uh, it's, it's kind of, if you look at the uh, cost of admission back in where I could find some data in, in the 30s compared to today, and compare that in 2020 dollars, uh, which is inflation adjusted, it's actually a little bit less expensive to go uh, uh, to the caverns now than it was back then. Um, the, the other thing to note, and I don't know why this has dropped off, but you know, the, the actual attendance of the caverns has dropped off since uh, the peak roughly in the 80s and early 90s. And the, the only thing I can come up with uh, explaining that is that's about when uh, cable television became strong and uh, people were able to uh, watch uh, the National Geographic channel as opposed to actually uh, get off their butts and go visit these uh, sites. So anyway, with that, I'll stop and open it up for any questions or comments, and uh, please have at it. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mark, for that presentation. So if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat, or uh, you can turn your microphone on too. Hey, I've got a question. This is Tony. Yeah, totally. that was interesting. That was interesting. What I guess the first thing that crossed my mind with the um, with the bat poop is uh, first off, that's a lot of bat poop. <laughs> but did they? Um, I mean, like histoplasmosis, and I mean, was there were there ailments with those guys? Yeah, Mind you know, that, <laughs> shoveling around and all that stuff. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, the, uh, there was comments on the histoplasmosis. You know, I, I think this was pre OSHA. So it doesn't look like they documented the, you know, the health of the workers there, but it, it, it was definitely mentioned as the, you know, people were falling ill and the, you know, the longevity as a guano miner was relatively short. Yeah, I can imagine. Thanks. Sure. Hello, Mark. It's Tongwei. Yeah, hi, Tongwei. Hey. It's a good talk. Thank you so much. It's uh, really a lot of information there. And uh, I, I did visit the uh, Carbats uh, Kevin's and back two years ago. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really 
fantastic and nice. And uh, I re I'm really interested about your models about the formation of the caves. And uh, that's, uh, we see that you see that you have H2S on the CO2 and uh, that could be mainly generated from the, is from the source rocks. And then the migrate along the migration conduits and uh, except the oil on, except the H2S on the CO2, do they have uh, any kind of oil and the gas, the, the, you know, leakage on the oil and gas smoke accumulation in that area as well? Yeah, so, yeah, well, it's a great question and, and it immediately came to my mind too when I started to dig into, you know, how these caverns were formed. And it turns out that yes, uh, but only as uh, paleo accumulations or evidence of paleo accumulations through fluid inclusions. So those cave spars that I was talking about in the, in the last paper, actually they're just riddled with uh, bitumen uh, fluid inclusions. Uh, you know, it looked like it was almost growing in, a, in an oil field and it might have been at the time. And then there are also some reported uh, hydrocarbon bearing inclusions uh, in, in some of the carbonates uh, within the, the caves. Now, I'd have to dig into some of those studies to find exactly where. But the, yes, you definitely had hydrocarbons uh, floating around the system. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Sure. So, Mark, when uh, did, did they when did they find out, and what did they find out about? You know, if you touch those formations, they turn black. Yeah, well, the, the, uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, Jenna, but uh, you know, there are people that were crawling around, holding, uh, putting their hands on those formations for you know decades before they, they actually put some constraints on uh, uh, where the visitors could go and how they could go. Uh, I, I would expect that a lot of that was just by the, you know, observation that the, the scene where people had been, you know, putting their hands on the, the speleothems, stalactites or stalagmites, and saw that it was giving them problems. So, but I, I don't know exactly when they realized that. Hi, this is Barbara. Um, I was wondering how, when the formations actually started coming. Did the cave form way early, and then the formations came later. The the beautiful. Yeah, story. that's a good question, and I didn't touch on that. But it's uh, yes. So the the caves were you know dissolved relatively early. So back in the uh, late Miocene and Pliocene, but then you have had some uh, water. Uh, you know, that's been percolating from the top, you know, the, that's the apogenic process. And that uh, water with the carbonic acids has actually created these the stalactites and stalagmites and other speleothems within the, the cavern. So that, that's a later process. Thank you. Sure. So Mark, you have a few uh, questions in the comments here. Yeah, okay. Uh, Luis is asking, oh, first, uh, thanks, Kelly. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, your comment there. Uh, are the bats gone? Uh, Luis Macias is asking. And uh, no, there's still bats. They're, they're still flying around. And if you haven't been to the caverns, uh, Luis, you, you should go. It's, it's definitely worth the trip. Okay, the question from uh, Victor is how would the Carlsbad Caverns and the Guano, uh, if it would not have been found, look like a million in a million years? Well, that's a great question. I guess, uh, you know, the, uh, there's fossilized guano. And, you know, actually um, in South America, it would have been one of the areas and still is one of the areas that have been exploited for guano, in some cases uh, exploited in not in a very good way. Uh, but some of that guano that's been exploited has been fossilized. So it essentially is turned to rock and then they've mined that, that guano. So it becomes hard and, uh, you, you know, basically quarry it. Okay, uh, let's see. Which would be the best museum in New Mexico to see the paintings? Well, it's probably uh, the museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, Art Museum uh, there. Um, as I said, Kathy, the, uh, sometimes uh, if you're lucky, you can see the 
his paintings of um, the caverns uh, at uh, the park headquarters in Carlsbad, but uh, they do rotate those out. And uh, uh, it, yeah, so the best place to go is Santa Fe. Uh, Victor is making a, another comment of Guano in Peru in early 1800s, yeah. And here's a little comment. You know, the, the uh, part of the early, um, well, maybe not so early, but part of the, a strong drive for uh, colonization and exploitation of the Pacific in the, the 1800s was driven by guano, mainly uh, driven by trying to find uh, uh, guano for uh, making gunpowder at the time, and then subsequently for fertilizer. So there was a whole uh, scheme set up uh, where there's, you know, slave labor were uh, being used for guano mining uh, across the Pacific, including, you know, areas of Peru and some of the islands. Uh, and actually the U.S. even uh, got into the act by uh, allowing for some islands that hadn't been previously claimed to be claimed by the U.S. Uh, and to allow for uh, guano exploitation. So some of the islands that we currently hold like uh, Palmyra Island, uh, Johnson Island, and a few others were uh, as a result of uh, guano exploration. Mark, I'll add, I, I was looking up your grandfather on the other screen here, and I guess every he started a tradition where he would burn an effigy of the gloom of the year, is that correct? Zosabra? Yeah, that's, so if you yeah, ever want to go, I think it's going to be, um, televised this year nationally, but it's called uh, this, uh, Fiesta, so Santa Fe Fiesta, and they burn uh, this big puppet, uh, which is called Zobra, which is uh, Spanish for gloom. And so it's, uh, it's a big event this year because of COVID. I, I, I don't think they're gonna have it in person, but they'll, they'll uh, allow for everybody to watch this, this uh, effigy being burned. I think That's 2020 could use that. <laughs> grandfather uh, formed Zozobra? Yeah, yeah, he did. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So if you haven't seen it, uh, it's worth uh, checking it out. It's kind of neat. Yeah, I frightened my children at Zozobra one year. <laughs> yeah, it is a little frightening. Well, if we don't have any more questions, Great. Well, we appreciate the talk, Mark. It was very interesting. A lot of history and a lot of geology there, too. So it was a good mix. Yeah, well, thanks. And, and uh, thanks again, Evan and Angie and Aaron for uh, orchestrating this. So it, you know, it's nice to have uh, yeah, it's time to get the together. Talk, Mark. And, uh, it was great. Appreciate everybody's time. So thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank thanks you, Mark. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend.